New York. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. Welcome to another edition of CWS Journeys. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very special welcome to you. As you know, we are going into the Christmas season and uh, or, the, or Christmas actually in another few days and the end of the year. Tonight, this evening is actually the last show of the season and what a a wonderful way to end the season with some of you may not know him as yet, but I'll introduce him to you in a few moments, Dr. Didicus Jules, who is the Director General of OECS Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. I am not going to actually take a break this evening. I am going to bring Dr. Jules on. The gentleman next to me is Dr. Didicus Jules. Dr. Jules, good evening and welcome to CWS Journeys. Hi, thanks everyone. It's a pleasure to be on. Dr. Didicus Jules mm -hmm. assumed the post of Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States in May 2014. In this capacity, he is responsible for driving the Regional Integration Trust towards a single economic and social space involving 10 Eastern Caribbean states. Dr. Jules has had extensive regional and international experience most of it focused on education, social policy, and organizational transformation. He served as Registrar and Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Examinations Council from 2008 to 2014, leading a thorough modernization of the Council. He has also served as Vice President, Human Resources, Cable, and Wireless, St. Lucia, 2005 to 2008, Permanent Secretary for Education and Human Resource Development, St. Lucia, 1997 to 2008, as well as Permanent Secretary for Education and Chief Education Officer in Revolutionary Grenada from 1981 to 1983. I, I can go on and on, but one of the things I like to do on this show is to give our guests an opportunity to take us through their timeline and give us a glimpse of who they are and what they're doing. Dr. Jules, if you were not the Director General of OECS, and doing what you're doing today, what career would you like to have tried? <laughs> well, growing up as a kid, I, was, I always wanted to be a, a medical doctor, a surgeon. Mm -hmm. But from infant school, that was my aspiration. Um, I, I used to dissect everything I could get my hands on as a primary school student. Um, so yeah, medicine was my preferred calling, but when I, um, when I sat my O-levels at the time, I failed physics, and um, in, in, in order to go on to do sixth form science, I had to have physics. So rather than face what I felt to be the disgrace of staying back a year to do one subject, I just proceeded to do the arts. I was always a good literature student anyway. Born and raised in St. Lucia. <clears throat> Dr. Jules, give us a glimpse of life growing up in St. Lucia at ages 9 and 15. At ages 9 and 15? 15, 1-5. 15, 9 to 15. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was an amazing time. I grew up in a, a part of Cass Street, the capital city called Grass Street. And Grass Street was an amazing um, community. It was, at the, at, in those days, the communities were mixed. You didn't have communities as segregated by class as you tend to have now, you know, with high-income communities and low-income communities. So Grass Street was like a, a sort of Miguel Street. And in fact, there's a book that has been written about life in Grass Street by a guy called Peter Springer. Yeah. Who is OAS right now. Um, and it was an amazing community because Grass Street actually produced some very important personalities in St. Lucia, St. Lucia social history. Derek Walcott was my next door neighbor. Oh, really? His backyard adjoined our backyard. <laughs> Growing up as a kid, I knew his mom, his family was close to mine. Um, we were able to observe the cultural activities of the Walcott brothers from our balcony upstairs. But there was a, a carnival band. They had one of the most creative carnival bands called Turks, the Turks band, and we'd observe. And in fact, my dad bought one of the first copies of Walcott's book. His mother had purchased, um, had actually borrowed $500, which was an astronomical sum at the time, to self-publish his first book of poems. 
So my dad bought it, and in fact, I have that copy today, which I brought to Derek recently for him to autograph. Um, and then there were, you know, a lot of, it was a, an amazing community because you were really a child of the neighborhood. And to compound it, Grass Street was a dead end. Was, the road was a dead end. There was a dead end at one end. So we were able to really have a lot of socializing in the dead end part of the road. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it was quite an amazing experience, really. Your, 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 your father bought you this. Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about your parents. What, what are the fondest memories you have as your, of your parents as a child? Um, their absolute attention to us, their devotion to each other, and the fact that um, for my parents, education was the most important thing in life. Um, I recall that... When I was growing up, I used to be a voracious reader from infant school. So I couldn't wait to become a member of the Central Library. Mm -hmm. In those, I think you had to be at least 10 years old or so to be a formal member. So my mom, my mom went in and signed on my behalf. So she took a membership on my behalf. And within a month of that, I got my aunt to come in and my dad to come in and they got membership in the library. So instead of borrowing two books at a time, I could borrow six at a time. <laughs> And, um, and did a lot of reading. And then when I was about um, when I was about 12 years old, my parents started giving me a book allowance. So I'd get $5 a month in order to buy books. The one stipulation is that they were absolutely against comics because they felt comics had bad English and so on. And I was able to persuade them to allow me to buy a set of comics called the classics because these were the comic renditions of classical books and literature like Robinson Crusoe and so on. Yes. I had a huge collection of classics and every Saturday my dad would bring us into town and bring us, you know, window shopping and for ice cream and so on. And we had a ritual that he really enjoyed because he would ask us, okay guys, um, what do you want to buy? Um, would you have like some ice cream? And then I would always say to him, well, I don't mind the ice cream, I'll prefer you buy me a book. So I think he just loved to hear me say that. So he like <laughs> that ritual every Saturday. So I'd get both ice cream and my book. <laughs> if you were to eavesdrop your parents mm -hmm. telling a stranger about you, what do you think either of them would say, each of them would say? Let's start with mom. Well, my mom, I was, I think I was a favorite. My mom died when I was quite young, actually. I was about 12, 13 years old when she died. Um, but I was her favorite, and I think she would speak in glowing terms about me. But I had this thirst for learning. So it wasn't just about book knowledge, because my parents had this principle that every August holiday, you have to get a, a holiday job. Not for the money, but for the experience. So... On my own, I decided to vary the types of work I did. So my first job was in a toy shop, and my second job was a, 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 a pricing clerk at MNC. And then I started doing other jobs. Like um, one year, I, was, I worked on a construction site. My dad was building a, a, an apartment building, so I worked on that with the guys. And then I worked in a garage, and so I varied the type of work to get a wide range of experiences, and that was very helpful to me. Um, but I also would do things like when I see my mom doing stuff. Well, first she insisted that we learn to cook and wash and sew, and I was like, well, that's woman's work. And uh, she insisted that there's no such thing as woman's work; you have to learn it. At the very least, so no woman would make you suffer. So she taught me to cook, wash, and sew. And I kind of took to it, and um, then I would see her doing her curlers and, you know, making up her nails and so on, and ask her to teach me to do that, which was a fatal error, because immediately afterwards, every time she was tired, she would tell her, do her nails and curl up her hair and so on, you know, so. Are you the oldest? I, yeah, I'm the eldest. Uh -huh. so I think my mom would, you know, say that I was, uh, you know, a good son, you know, a first for learning, always eager to do something new. My dad, on the other hand, was a very strict guy, mm -hmm. uh, very Catholic, and um, he considered me a, re a rebel without a cause. Because in his view, I should live a good middle class life and you know, settle into a profession. And he was very, very distraught with some of my rebellious things. Although 
I tried on many occasions to point out to him that my rebellion was not without a cause. It was totally in keeping with the ethical principles by which I was raised. Mm. You have to stand up for your rights. You have to stand up for other people. You have to you know, be respectful of other people. And you have to stand for justice. So um, he was very distressed when I went to Grenada to work in the revolution, abandoning my master's degree. But I think in the end, he, um, he was very proud of it. So I, 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 I just want to spend a little bit more time in your early timeline. And, and uh, I also want you to give us a glimpse into that 15-year-old uh, Didicus. But here you are, a young man. That is very strict. Reading sort of confines you to the home. Yet you were passionate about getting books and reading. Why so? Um, I don't know. I guess it was the, the, the family culture in which I was raised. My parents read stories to us. They encouraged us to read a lot. So I read a lot. And, um, and they encouraged us. So it, it kind of had a concatenation effect. The more, gotcha. you, more, the more your mind gets open. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I was kind of, as we say, in San first right, because the books that were available to me to read at home, my dad was a member of a Catholic book club, and these books were very, well, way above my level, but I read, I tried to read them and tried to understand them. So I read stuff like, you know, the Confessions of St. Augustine and the works of Thomas Merton and so on. And it kind of... They were very philosophical books, but yeah, they, I think they helped to shape me and my outlook on life and the world. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And the 15-year-old Didicus, what was going on at 15? Well, at 15, I think it was the era of black power coming into the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And um, it made a, a transition from being strongly Catholic to being very politically conscious in that period because my father was a member of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which is a Catholic charitable organization, and used to take us on these um, excursions to provide food for the poor. And when I saw the extent of poverty, I mean, I wasn't from a rich family, but you know, we never needed anything as children. <clears throat> when I saw the level of deprivation of others in the society, right in Castries itself, I was quite astounded and, you know, really questioned what kind of society were we living in when people had to suffer that level of indigence. So it, it sparked a certain degree of indignation in me. Um, and then, of course, because of all my reading, I read about the Black Power thing. I'll never forget the first really political book I read was Seize the Time by Bobby Seale, who was a member of the Black Panther Party. Uh, to this day, I remember the opening paragraph of that, which I can't repeat on your show because it was full of expletives. <laughs> but, you know, he spoke about when Martin Luther King was killed. He was so pissed off. He ran on the block and, you know, pelted stones and all of that. But it, it really was a rude awakening. And um, I became very conscious of some of the subtle indignities of race and class in St. Lucia at the time. It was still parts of St. Lucia, like Capex State and VG, where black people couldn't live. They only came in as, as helpers and assistants, you know. So, so and, and that journey was guided in, at a crucial point because, you know, when you sort of finding your own road, mm -hmm. um, you can, you make a lot of mistakes. At, at, when I was in, at, at 15, I was in Form 5 at St. Mary's College. And one day, this priest, we were very rebellious at the college. Um, we had a, we used to wear these Afro sandals and you know, big Afros and so on. And uh, we, we had a, a student council that was very progressive and very vociferous. And the principal at the time was progressive in his own way, Brother Donatus. He agreed to change the official way of the college from woolen blazers that we used to wear to shirt jack suits with the, sh the school crest. And then they said he left and he was replaced by an autocrat called Dr. Um, I forget his name now, another, another presentation brother, Luguri, Brother Luguri. And Brother Luguri said that he didn't recognize any student council. And we were 
playing a very effective part in the governance of the school, you know, in terms of helping to make student discipline and, you know, get, getting actively involved in the life of the school. And he squashed all of that. So, but, but the fatal mistake he made was to say to us that he was an admirer of Eric Geary in Grenada. So that had our backs up. And um, anyway, one day, this young priest comes along and says that he's been assigned to teach us religious knowledge. So we locked him out of the classroom. And then he begged us to just let him in. He just wanted to talk to us for half an hour. And we, if we decide we want him to come back, he'd come back. If we don't want him to come back, he won't. That was Father Patrick Anthony. And we let him in and he started talking about the Black Power Movement in Trinidad. So we were totally blown away. I mean, a Catholic priest talking about Black Power. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to hear more, and then he came back, and then he formed something called a study and action group, which involved college boys, convent girls, and some lay people, young lay people in the Catholic Church, and took us on this amazing journey of discovering our country. Um, he did for us what Harry Simmons did for Derek Walker. We started going around the countryside with, with Papa, as we called him, to see to meet, like, to participate in cultural events, some of which was scorned by, by you know, upper class people at the time, like the Laos festivals. We did research on the folk culture of St. Lucia. In fact, out of that, we had a program for investigation of the folk culture and documentation of the folk culture. And that eventually became the Folk Research Center, which is the largest repository today of cultural material on St. Lucia. Um, and then there was a prison literacy program, which I coordinated. That was a product of the Folk Research Center as well. And that's what piqued my interest in education. And, um, and then he took a select group of us into a smaller, more, more exclusive uh, mentoring group called the Black Studies Group, and took us on this journey where we studied Fanon, Franz Fanon, and Albert Camus and Sat, Jean-Paul Sat, and Eric Williams and Walter Rodney. In fact, when I went to university a couple of years later, I did, I, when I registered to do West Indian sociology, I discovered that three quarters of the books on the syllabus I had already read because of Father Anthony's uh, work with us in the Black Studies group. Now, so, let's ease up your ease up your timeline a little bit. <clears throat> Still this young man, fifth or sixth form, teaching at the prisons, having been introduced to some very profound literature because of your father's access to the Catholic Church, then introduced to Father, Father Anthony, a sort of revolutionary. Now here is this young man transforming in his ideas, his politics, is social consciousness. You were also introduced to what you considered poverty and was very shocked by, by, by it when your father took you around, you and your, your, your siblings, to feed, <laughs> to feed the hungry. Tell us about that experience when you started teaching at the prison. How did that experience continue to mold this gentleman that we are, have come to know as Dr. Vilikas Jules? Well, it was a very profound experience because, you know, in, in most societies, prisoners are considered almost the, the wretched of the youth. They're the scum of the society because they are criminals and various forms of stereotyping. So we went there initially as do-gooders, thinking, well, we're going to help these guys to reform themselves and so on. And because we were using, attempting to use Paulo Freire's methodology of conscientization, where you focus on the condition of the oppressed mm -hmm. as a basis for them becoming more self-conscious about their conditions in life and their options for betterment. Um, we, we learned so much about prison. I mean, it was a real journey um, in, an, in understanding for us. I think we learned more than the prisoners learned. Because while we were teaching them to read and write, we were learning also what about the society itself. I remember, you know, the first class we had, we put up the word prison on the board and asked people, what does prison mean to you? And when they started really delving into themselves and talking about the experience of prison, 
from that initial class, we got material for a whole year of classes. We were able to record what they said, um, not not audio by audio, but you know by transcription, and um, we were able to come back to them and say, okay, today we're going to be discussing the theme of prison and family. Because recording, if this person said that, that person said this, this other person said that. And these all relate to the theme of prison and family. So let's discuss how does prison affect your family? How does prison impact family life? Um, or the lack of family and so on. So we went deeper into that theme. We discussed um, the question of time. So, I mean, that was one of the, the most profound philosophical experiences for me. The notion of time that we have as ordinary people is not the same notion of time that a prisoner has because it's, one of the guys said to us, you know, time is what condemns you and time is what frees you. Mm. So your whole existence, the clock is a different symbol for you altogether. And, um, you know, we started understanding the, some of the structural injustice in society um, when guys recounted stories of knowing of big boys in the society who had committed white collar crimes and with huge impacts on the wider society and not even ever see the inside of a cell. And, you know, small guys from stealing stuff ending up on three months in jail and so on. We learned a great deal from that. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people one of my favorite quotations is from Dostoevsky in his book, White Nights, where he asks, how can you live and not have a story to tell? <laughs> I, I, I told my staff at CXC and my farewell that, you know, one of the problems is that too often we try to tell our own stories. But mm -hmm. in the end, what, what really, well, your story must be told by your example. It must be told by the results that you achieve. And then your story tells you. Dr. Dilikas, by, by the end of this conversation, I'm hoping that a big chunk of your story, and I'm not trying to be presumptuous here, will be told. But tell us, are there times when your story is being told and what you envision as your story conflicts? Well, yeah, that's a frequent experience. I mean, people have... I don't think people have looked, those persons who, with whom, whose paths I have crossed either love me or hate me absolutely. Mm. Because um, it's just how it is. Um, I, I always tell people, everywhere I've worked, I've said to, to the staff that from the first day I walk in, I have a standard speech. I say to them, if you won't be on the call of duty, I'll be the biggest win beneath your wings. If you're a slacker, I'll be your worst nightmare. Because I think we have a responsibility that's far further and deeper than ourselves. Um, especially when you work in the public service. A job is not just a job. It's not just for a salary. It has to be for a cause. Right? And we have an obligation to deliver quality service and to work with passion. Um, so... What... What are sometimes, sometimes, I mean, like, and again, because of my life experiences, there mm -hmm. are people who, for example, because of my involvement in the Grenada Revolution, I have been categorized at different points as being a communist. And people see you within that construct, right? So for some people, being a communist means being a devil. So I've been demonized by some people. I had a particular experience after the collapse of the Grenada Revolution. I was walking the streets of Castries and came across a friend of mine. So we, he was talking to a young lady, we stopped, greeted each other, and then we ended up in this hour-long conversation <clears throat> about some issues in St. Lucia. And the young lady at a certain point said, well, I, you know, we've been talking all this time, I don't know who you are, so I introduced myself. He said, you are the little Jews? I said, yeah. He said, well, I would never believe that you have these views because of what I've heard about you. I said, what did you hear about me? And she said, I mean, I heard you are communist and all of that. But so her, her expectation of the type of person I am was very different from who she found me to be. 
So, Doc, Dr. Jules, what what are people um, do you believe are people surprised to learn about you when they get to know you? Well, a lot of people think, especially in the workplace, that I'm hard and inflexible. Um, but the people who work productively would tell a different story because I believe that aside from the exigencies and the requirements of the job and the work, yes, issues of performance, I as a as a chief executive anywhere I am have an obligation and a duty to ensure that my impact on whoever I work with is for the better. Um, Every secretary with whom I've worked in my former life now have either PhDs or master's degrees. Because I always encourage people to be more than they can be at any given moment. Right? Dr. Right. Ju this is day one of RCS Live's New York trip, and we are at Princess Juliana Airport heading to JFK in a couple of hours. Stay tuned. RCS Live! I have to go check in. Dans l'avion, ça y est, on est déjà tout parti. Ça va être génial. bunch of gift bags for our rooms and we got like cookies and drinks and all that so that was really nice with our Art Saves Lives logo on it so they're really supporting us and they want to show our art and different things like that so we're really happy it's cool 